My name is Evelyn. I am 36 years old. You know I'm here, alive, because you can hear my voice. But there are many Evelyns. Some of them have died already. Some of them have lived. Most of them have changed. My husband was in government when things began to go wrong. Our family was targeted and I was imprisoned. I spent three years of my life in prison. It may as well have been 30. As I entered the prison, a male guard smiled at me. I was frightened, but believed I would be safe. Instead, I was constantly watching my back to see if I was being followed. Sometimes the male guards would not let me leave my cell to eat with the others until I had sex with them. After months of this, I became sick and it was difficult to go to the toilet. I asked one time to see a doctor, but a prison guard beat me so bad, I learned to keep quiet. Eventually, my husband managed to get me out. At first, we were so happy to be reunited. I thought, ah, things will be okay again. But when I told him what had happened, he grew very quiet, then very angry. Before this, he had been worried about me. But now something changed and he grew almost suspicious. It was after I told him I had been raped. Things were very difficult after that. My husband, my community, even my family treated me differently. I heard of a group of women who had been through the same things. I sat and listened as other women spoke about what happened to them. They too felt that there were many selves, many roses, many Mabels, many Evelyns. Sharing with each other released some of the pain. Who could understand us? Only each other. There was another group for the husbands and boyfriends of the other women, and my husband agreed to come along. After a while, he understood what had happened to his Evelyn. Now, we are slowly coming closer together. My name is Evelyn, and I've come to understand that what happened to me was wrong. I want to make sure that this does not happen to any woman again. Will you help me? Stories like Evelyn's are all too common in Africa. Human Rights Watch estimates that one in four women in the Great Lakes region have suffered from sexual violence. In some African countries, it is more dangerous to be a woman than it is to be a soldier. Women are especially vulnerable. The torture experiences of women may also mean being subjected to rape and sexual violence by their perpetrators. Women in prisons and detention can be at risk of this and other kinds of torture. Their sexual and reproductive health can be challenged. Services may not be available or purposefully withheld. In Evelyn's story, we see that the nightmare does not end with the violence. Stigma, strained relations with partners, illness and psychological distress are very likely after women have experienced sexual violence and torture. Worse is this rejection that comes with the cultural stigma of women who have survived rape. Sexual violence and torture affects entire families and communities. Good rehabilitation and support will recognize this. How can we support survivors and their families and communities? My name is Matilda. I am 34 years old and HIV positive. I am a survivor of torture. The things that happened to me in those 24 hours in the cattle crawl, they have changed my life forever. I knew there were risks involved with my activism. I was young, the student movement was strong, and there was a sense that we could change things, really change things. One day, things did change. After a small rally at our university campus, a group of youths who supported the ruling government pulled me into a car. I was blindfolded and taken to a spot in the bush where cattle were kept. The smell of livestock, even now, takes me back to that time and I cannot stop shaking. For a whole day and night I was interrogated, beaten 
and burned all over my body with hot firewood. I was half dead when my clothes were cut off with a knife and two men took turns to rape me. I was left in the bush for three days before a farmer found me and took me to the hospital. My wounds needed treatment, but so did my mind, so did my heart. My whole life was affected from this incident. I could not lift heavy things including my child or the wood I would sell to make money. I was constantly sick and weak. Eventually, the doctors discovered that I had HIV. I see a social worker, take my drugs daily, and see a counselor. I received some small money from an NGO to start a sewing business from my home, so I don't need to carry heavy things to make some money. I can support myself and my child again. Things are beginning to look better. My body is healing slowly. Slowly. There is only one thing that stays in my mind. My torturers. The people who did this to me are free men. I see them in town while I remain in this captive place in my mind. And I think of justice. Where is the justice? The consequences of torture can go beyond the mental and psychological plane inflicted. It can mean contracting HIV, an impact on livelihoods, economic and social security. With long-term care rehabilitation, survivors can go to lead full lives. But without justice, the psychological distress of survivors can continue to be prolonged. Without justice, survivors can feel that the torture is in some ways continuing. In 2015, over 122 countries were found to engage in acts of torture. At that same time, access to justice in many of these countries is lacking. Together, this can often lead to impunity for perpetrators. The Robben Island Guidelines provide a clear path for African states to prevent, prohibit and combat impunity for torture. They pay particular attention to the need to combat gender-related forms of torture. Unfair trials, mismanagement of the court systems and few legal resources for victims all make it hard for survivors to get justice. For victims, their families and communities, access to justice and reparations can go a long way in healing scars. It can also send a clear message that torture is a violation of human rights. My name is Maria. I am 40 years old and a refugee. After we married, my husband and I walked our land together. The police came to our house one day. They beat him. Why? Because he was a member of my country's opposition party. He complained of chest pains and later died. A few years after his death, I was attending a meeting following in his footsteps. They came to arrest me this time. I was held for three days without food. I was told I was being released. Instead, the policeman drove me a long way. And when he pulled me out, we were somewhere in the bush. I fought him, but he kicked me, trampled on my whole body. He burnt me with cigarettes on my thighs and on my buttocks. He raped me and smeared his semen all over me. He urinated on me. He said he wanted to make sure I never forgot what he did to me. He took me back to the police station and made me wash away all the evidence. He said if I told anyone, no one would believe me. If I told anyone, it would kill me. After this, my father decided I needed to leave the country. One night, he took me to the border where I paid the truck driver to take me across. I thought I would escape the dangers that I faced in my homeland. But here, the dangers remain the same. I am always worried that I will be returned to my homeland and the same things will happen to me again. I cannot go back. For many years, I have lived with these secrets in silence. I tell people about my government. I tell them why I fled. But I do not tell them what happened to me. But talking about it has helped me to cope. And now I am telling you my story. And I ask you, what will you do with it? For those fleeing situations where they face torture, their protection is not always guaranteed. Up to 35% of refugees have experienced torture, with even higher levels found in African refugee groups. Torture aims to break down the humanity, dignity and self-respect of the individual. Fear. 
is an essential element of torture. For women, the kinds of torture they experience and their rehabilitation needs vary from men. Gender roles can change as a result from the experience and coping mechanisms can differ. These are the experiences that women torture survivors will not tell you about at the first encounter. Yet they continue to live with them, hurting and broken inside. Long-term care. Strengthening national frameworks for preventing and prosecuting perpetrators and gender-sensitive programming are some of the things that survivors are telling us they need. Torture affects our women, our men, and it affects communities. Support our survivors. Support our communities. Support justice. Torture stops now.